Hello, my name is Ginevra Williams and I'm from Guildford in the UK. I'm going to talk to you today about boys changing voices. When boys reach adolescence, this is caused by changing hormone levels. One thing we need to bear in mind is that growth is not linear. Growth happens in stages or spurts. So we will get a rapid period of growth and then we have a plateau and then we have another rapid period of growth. Now we know that anyone who's watched a child grow knows that they stay in the same clothes for a bit and then suddenly they grow out of everything and then they stay in the new set for a while. This growth of the body is mirrored by the growth of the larynx. So as the body is growing, so the larynx grows too. Let's have a look at what that looks like. This is a cross section across the thyroid cartilage. And we can see that in girls, it grows, that the larynx does grow. In boys, it's a significant increase. 66% is a large increase in size. And there's the, the mean vocal fold lengths there underneath that. When will it begin? This is a crucial question. And the boy is born with a biological clock, which will determine when that happens. It's partly genetic. Is there any way that you can delay this? If you've got a boy who's a brilliant treble singer, can you prolong that career for longer? This might sound like a daft question, but I have been asked this question many times by choral directors. And I say, yes, there are ways that you can delay it, but they're fairly drastic. Castration, starvation, chronic illness, or severe emotional deprivation. Now of those, the one that you may come across is chronic illness. And uh, a boy, for example, I had a student with cystic fibrosis whose voice changed when he was between 16 and 17. So a little bit later than one would normally expect. Obesity can also influence voice change because of the estrogen held in fat cells. So it can slightly um, accelerate voice change in girls and it can slightly delay voice change in boys. Apart from that, the other question is, is this happening any younger now? Are boys' voices changing younger than they did, say, 100 years ago? This is a difficult question to answer because our ways of measuring this are much more sophisticated now. We can measure voice change with levels of testosterone in the blood, for example, which obviously wasn't done at the time when J.S. Bach was writing about his choristers in the Tomanakor in Leipzig. We do know that boys in the past may have been kept singing on the soprano line beyond their voice change, beyond the point at which their speaking voice was lowering. Whether or not that's good practice, we're gonna look at later in this talk. But the records at the time were of when the boy stopped singing soprano. We don't know what his speaking voice sounded like. There are other possible influences that we haven't looked at yet that have not been researched. They're just theories. It is possible that boys' voices are changing slightly younger, but maybe not as much younger as we have been led to believe. So basically, the hormones come in and there's nothing you can do about it. So we need to prepare the boy for what's gonna happen and we welcome the change when it happens. It's a gradual change. It's not overnight. No part of the body can grow that much overnight. We also have a little bit of warning because there's an order in which the body grows. Normally, the feet will grow first. So we know by looking at the boy's feet and by asking him about his shoe size, 
that if there's been a significant increase in that, the chances are there'll be a change in his voice. And asking a boy about new shoes is not a personal question. In fact, I know uh, one colleague of mine who runs a boys choir who has a new shoe club and anybody who has new shoes comes and tells her and shows her his new shoes. And they then have a discussion about the fact that the voice will, the voice change will follow on soon. So feet first, then the long bones. So then there'll be a growth spurt in the, the height, overall height of the boy. Then there'll be a growth in the larynx. So the time span for over that is probably about three to six months. So you've got a little bit of warning of when things are going to happen. The first significant research looking at this and looking at measurements of boys' voices was done by John Cooksey in the 1970s. And he originally published in 1977 and then continued writing and publishing for many years after this. These were his initial findings. And he specified these stages, one, two, three, four, and then five, yeah, or emerging adult and with this, the addition of falsetto there at the end. Cooksey's work was then taken and compared with that of John Tanner. Now Tanner was a pediatrician who published uh, observations and measurements looking at boys' physical growth. And he identified five distinct changes, five distinct stages that you could look at. Um, in the 90s, 97, research was published comparing Cooksey and Tanner, found that they correlated. So here we can see Tanner's stages here correlating quite neatly with Cooksey's stages. And here is the the relationship between testosterone level and the fundamental frequency of the voice. So we know now that Cooksey's observed stages tie in perfectly well with our knowledge of physical changes. This is what Cooksey's model looks like now. This is from his later publications, slightly neatened up version. And it's a very, very useful chart. So we have the extended singing range, comfortable singing range and speech. So we'll start with the speech. This is the average fundamental frequency of the speaking voice. So anybody's speaking voice will go up and it'll go down. So we take the average and then we know what we know where, where we are really when we know what the speaking voice is doing. And we can look here that the Stage one is around about middle C, and then it just gradually gets lower and lower. This is, of course, during change. Once the boy gets beyond stage five, he's then an emerging adult. The comfortable modal singing range is also the same as the speaking range. The extended singing range here, the unfilled note is more variable. The lower end is generally fairly stable. Our speaking pitch will always be about one third above our lowest comfortable singing note. And that's a pretty universal measure. Give or take a semitone that we will speak about one third above our lowest comfortable singing note. This is a very, very useful measure to know when we are assessing boys' voices. The upper end here is the one that's very variable. Some boys, when they get, for example, get to stage three, will only have one octave. One octave only in which they can produce a sound. Other boys will have an extended upper range. So there's, there is variety there. If we listen to the singing voice and only the singing voice, it's much more difficult to tell. 
So let's listen to some recordings now. Jesus, the very thought of thee, which sweetness fills the breast, but sweeter for thy face to see, and in thy presence rest. So that is obviously the voice of a young boy, unchanged. What about this one? <laughs> That's two octave scale of G to G. A little bit of instability at the top. At the bottom, he doesn't sound he's going, like he's going to go much lower than that. So he could be unchanged or stage one. He could possibly be going into stage two. We don't know for definite. What about this one? The first that from the side of rise doth ask a drink divine. But my time What is that? Is that a voice that is starting to change? Is that a voice that has changed a fair bit, but is singing in a falsetto sound? If you're very experienced at listening to boys' voices, you may know. So that sounds more like a stage three to four voice. That was the same boy that we heard in the third recording, and that was recorded three months later. So where does that put the whole voice change? It's probably much easier to listen to the speaking voice. So this is a recording of one boy and it's taken over a period of four years and it's compressed so it's spliced together and we can hear the the gradual lowering of the voice we can also hear the voice is getting richer as the vocal folds thicken and we can hear the vocal tract lengthening so we're hearing different aspects of change in this voice There was once a young rat named Arthur who would never take the trouble to make up his mind. Whenever his friends asked him if he would like to go out with them, he would only answer, I don't know. He wouldn't say yes, and he wouldn't say no either. He could never learn to make a choice. His Aunt Helen said to him, No one will ever care for you if you carry on like this. You have no more mind than a blade of grass. Arthur looked wise, but said nothing. One rainy day, the rats heard a great noise in the loft where they lived. The pine rafters were all rotten, and at last one of the joists had given way and fallen to the ground. The walls shook, and the rat's hair stood on end with fear and horror. This won't do, said the old rat, who was chief. I'll send out scouts to search for a new home. The speaking voice is a much more reliable measure. People don't mess with their speaking voices as much as they mess with their singing voices. We tend to hear what's actually going on. Now you can listen to the pitch of a speaking voice and you can ask the boy to do some monotonous task like counting backwards from 20 to one or reciting the days of the week or the months of the year. 
And as long as it's boring, he will settle on a monotone and you can then just hum along. And you can get a pretty good idea that way. Or you can now use an app and you can speak into the app and that will tell you what your average fundamental frequency is. So let's compare now speaking and singing. So here is the unchanged singing voice. You're on the dates with me The pickings have been lush And yet before this evening is over You might give me the brush You might His speaking voice is stage two 20, 19, 18, 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. I love her till I die. Surely you heard my lady go down the garden singing. Stage 3. 20, 19, 18, 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Somebody make me come through. I'll always be there, as frightened as you, to help us survive. Being alive. 20, 19, 18, 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. When true simplicity is gained to bow. To bend, we shan't be ashamed To turn, turn will be our delight Till by turning, turning we come round right There was once a young rat named Arthur who would never take the trouble to make of his mind. Whenever his friends asked him if he would like to go out with them, he would only answer, I don't know. He wouldn't say yes, and he wouldn't say no either. You can never learn to make a choice. Sweep thy faint strings, musician, with thy long lean hand. Downward the starry tapers burn, sing soft the waning sand. The old hound couched in sleep the embers small the low across the walls the shadows come and go so you can hear his voice gradually getting lower as he gets older and we can look now at the correlation between that and his height. So the height is in blue here, and we can see there was a growth spurt there, and there was a significant drop in the frequency of his speaking voice. And then it leveled out for a bit, and then we had another growth spurt, and then that was followed by an even more significant lowering of his speaking voice. So there we can see the relationship between the height and the voice. So the question I want to ask is what do we do with the boy who can still sing high but his speaking voice is getting lower? So this is roughly stage three. Should the boy rest from singing? That used to be the advice. Should he carry on singing soprano if he can? 
if he's happy to do that and it looks and sounds okay or should he shift down to singing baritone which is going to be a little bit limited for him but he may get used to that and be more comfortable with it what is the answer to these questions well this has always been a matter of individual judgment but sometimes we get it wrong so this is where it's useful to have a little bit of evidence to back up what we what decision we should make so what is happening is incremental change over time now when things change just a tiny bit every day we don't notice the difference there's an analogy with boiling frogs when you drop a frog into boiling water it will leap out if you put a frog into cold water and bring it to the boil the frog will stay in there now we know that with injury if we have chronic misuse we don't notice that build up over time and then we have an acute event something happens we have sudden pain sudden onset and we look for a cause in that moment the cause has actually been building over a long period of time but we've reached a tipping point now this is what may happen with the boy's voice he will be able to carry on singing soprano and over time this will gradually get less and less comfortable he will manage and he will manage and he will manage and then he'll get to a tipping point now the trouble with the tipping point is that we then get catastrophic malfunction and if we add into that the third dimension of anxiety that potential for catastrophic malfunction is more likely to happen during performance and we have there are several written records of boys whose voices broke in the middle of a performance and this is probably what's happening is that their voice has been changing for some time you add in anxiety pressure difficulty and boom it's gone we don't want that to happen for any of the boys that we're working with this is some evidence i have from research i did several years ago and we were looking at boy choristers so these are boys who sing every day they're professional singers they sing in a cathedral it's high pressure environment they perform to an audience of several hundred people every day they do lots of live broadcasts they do lots of recordings they do lots of high profile concerts the measures i took were longitudinal over a period of three years and i measured them acoustically and with an electroglottograph which you can see there as the little this these little electrodes here little pads that sit either side of the larynx and they measure the signal across the larynx when the vocal folds come together the current flows and when the vocal folds come apart the current doesn't flow so you can get a really clear graph showing the vocal fold closure and opening and i was looking at specifically at what was happening in stage three and i've got recordings now of two boys boy one they're both in stage three okay boy one was singing soprano in the choir so he had carried on singing soprano during his voice change boy two had stopped singing soprano and was singing songs in tenor keys baritone keys so here we have recordings of these two boys and i want you just to listen to comfort levels all right that's all we're listening to so here we go boy one speaking 20, 19, 18, 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. 
Now this is the boy who's used to singing soprano. But sweet of thy face to see and in thy presence rest. And here he is attempting to sing lower. But sweet of thy face to see and in thy presence rest. And this is the second boy, his speaking voice. There was once a young rat named Arthur who could never take the trouble to make up his mind. But sweet of thy face to see and in thy presence rest. But sweet of thy face to see and in thy presence rest. So of those four recordings of singing, which one was the most comfortable? And I hope you will agree that it was the second boy singing low. Now that's a perceptual judgment, all right? That's what we go on all day, every day is perceptual judgments. Is there any evidence to back that up? If we say it sounds more comfortable, Therefore, it's better for you to be using that part of your voice than remaining to sing high. What evidence have we got? So this is recordings that I have of the first boy when he was 10 and then again when he was 13. So we can then compare what his voice sounded like when he was 10 with what it sounds like now in stage three. This is the luxury that nobody ever has because over the, once those three years have elapsed, we can't remember what he actually sounded like when he was 10. So here we go. Here's his speaking voice when he was 10. There was once a young rat named Arthur who would never take the trouble to make up his mind. And here's his speaking voice at 13. There was once a young rat named Arthur who could never take the trouble to make up his mind. Big difference. Now here he is singing a tiny fragment of the same song. But sweet of and then three years later. But sweet of so you can hear a difference there. When you compare them like that, side by side, you can hear a difference. When we look at the data, we see this. So this is the electroglottographic signal. So here we have the vocal fold closure and the vocal fold opening. Now, when he's 10 years old, we've got not very much closure, right, per cycle. But what we have got, if you look at the pink line, this shows you the rate of closure. And we've got a much steeper pink line there. So we have a faster snap together of the vocal folds, which is a much more efficient way of generating sound energy. So we've got a system that is working efficiently. The vocal folds don't need to stay together as long, but, and this is, this is equalized so that we know that both levels are the same loudness. Three years later, he's having to press his vocal folds together for longer per cycle. You can see there that the closure is greater per cycle. Here it is 25%, here it's 38%. That's a significant difference. And you can hear the difference in the sound. Let's listen to those again. But sweet of Another difference we can see is in the distribution of the upper frequencies in the sound. And here 
we've got this boost between four and 6,000 hertz, which is quite a common area to see that upper frequency boost in the children's voice. When he's 13, we don't have that. We've got a big hole there instead. So again, he's having to work harder to get a similar output. So if we're asking him to carry on singing exclusively in falsetto, are we boiling the frog? If we are, how do we know when to stop? Do we wait for everything to go disastrously wrong? Or do we move him down to a lower part before that happens? Well, the advice would be that you follow the Cooksey stages. You assess his speaking voice. You know then where his singing range, comfortable singing range is. And you put him into a voice part that fits with that comfortable singing range. So you follow the Cooksey stages and sing within the lowest comfortable pitch range. And if you want to find out more on this subject, you can go to my website and there are lots of resources that you can download for free or you can buy a copy of my book and or the DVD to go with it. Thank you very much for joining me today and listening to this fascinating research about boys changing voices. <laughs>